I wanted to say that I think that uh, there are some themes that have emerged from these very disparate talks. And um, one is that we may not agree on the moment where we became us. Um, and also the becoming of us may very well be an ongoing project. How do we know that we've arrived? Maybe in another 50,000 years, should our species happen to survive that long, um, we're going to realize that this was only a waypoint on the way to something else, um, something that may have um, been determined, as many of the past changes were, by our own behavioral innovations. Um, we, this leads me to the second theme that keeps coming out of these various talks, is that our behavior and our bi biology, as coded in our genes, are very deeply related. And that not only do they tell, may they tell something of the same story in different ways, um, but one may, in some cases, explain the other. That is, we may find that uh, what we're really looking at is a feedback relationship in which new f cognitive, physical, or other kinds of abilities lead to new behaviors, which in turn create, in a sense, a natural selection scenario in which the selection is actually cultural. That is, we need certain physical attributes in order to continue the behavioral trend on which we have embarked. So that we are looking at something that is not static. We don't reach a plateau and then stay there, but we're ever evolving. And this is the source of some differences, for instance, between um, people like, uh, for example, myself, who think that the humans who left Africa were quite capable of the whole range of behaviors we see in modern humans, and people like Nicholas Conard who think there were final uh, steps in the development of these capabilities that only happened in Europe, um, and that explain the great explosion of, of art and music and other kinds of things that we see in the archaeological record of that continent. Um, and then if we're going to see this as a feedback relationship, um, which came first? We have the chicken and egg problem. Was it the anatomically modern humans? If that is in fact meaningful, perhaps they weren't anatomically modern except in the little bit that we can detect of them in the bits and pieces of fossils that we have, but the more that we see those fossils, the more we realize that perhaps they're not as modern as we think. Uh, in fact, when we take the Howells data set or any of the data sets of modern humans and plot most of the late fossils against them that we call anatomically modern humans, we find that they don't tend to fall in the same places of the graph. Um, the, th the third theme that I think is emerging here uh, which is, I think, one of the more interesting uh, features that's quite new in our study of human evolution is the recognition that, in fact, simple models are not going to do it. That the picture, in fact, is much more complex and much more human than we had thought even a few years ago. That it's not out of Africa twice, out of Africa one and two, as you can't often see it, that there isn't some single ancestor or even a single population of ancestor, ancestors from whom we all derive. Um, but there are probably multiple uh, excursions out of Africa. And there are probably some, as Ofer mentioned, some excursions into Africa that we have not yet been able to detect. I, I think that the evidence is much thinner for those in the archaeological record. Perhaps the genetic record will inform us otherwise. Um, that said, there were some interesting specific themes that came up in the various talks. Um, I think that uh, Rick's talk, I think, was um, very important for us because it, despite the 
um, the argument that climate perhaps doesn't control what kinds of stone tools we make, um, but it does control where we're able to actually make a living and make those stone tools to some extent. Um, no one would imagine that you could uh, have made a lot of stone tools in the middle of the Sahara Desert uh, about 20,000 years ago because uh, there wasn't any water there and it would have been extremely difficult to be there at all, let alone be making stone tools. Um, so while the kind of stone tools might not be affected by the climate, where you are might. So the, the other thing that I liked was that uh, he, put, he puts human evolution in the context of not only more general climate trends, but also of mammalian evolution. So it isn't just the humans that we see responding, but also the mammals. And where we have the humans and the mammals going the same way, except that the, they're both becoming more able to deal with a greater range of, of climate ish, uh, kinds of conditions, you have more extinction going on in the mammals and less going on in the humans. Perhaps um, we should look more carefully at what the humans are doing to avoid that, ext that uh, extinction. And this is the whole question of how adaptability is being developed. And I like, I like this particularly because of the uh, development of these long distance networks, which I think are very much part of the story. Um, okay, so then um, we had, after Rick, we had um, Chris Stringer, um, and I'm not sitting here with the program, so I might get these out of order. But um, again, this, this is beginning to tell us that the picture is much more complicated in Africa than we thought, that um, Hadobergensis may be the ancestor of uh, both the Neanderthals and Denisovan lineage and our lineage. But the interesting part of the story also that he didn't talk much about, what we could think about, is that there are other offshoots of this Hadobergensis group, thank you, that um, seem to have gone extinct. And we tend not to think much about extinction in this whole evolutionary story. We think that whenever we have, except whenever we have a group that they tend to go on to uh, become something in the, in the final thing. But he had a graph in which there were several offshoots of Heidelbergensis that disappeared, like Homo antecessor, which I know my Spanish colleagues would not like to accept, but um, nevertheless, I think that extinction is probably much more common among uh, human subspecies, human subspecies, and also human cultures. Um, are we to accept, for instance, the theory that humans develop this fantastic symbolic culture in South Africa, and then that is the group that led to the rest of us? Or um, is that a group, in fact, that went extinct and had nothing to do with the rest of us? Um, we really can't be sure of that. So, um, and the archaeology would suggest much more likely that the latter uh, scenario was the case. Um, okay, I won't say anything about the, the East African archaeological evidence because I already said, said it all. But uh, the, the South African archaeological evidence is very interesting from the point of view of the cognitive implications of these very complex kinds of technological activities. And I think that was an interesting uh, comparison to the last talk by Ian Davidson, um, which also, which kind of separated these uh, cognitive achievements into a model of the growth, the modular growth of human cognition, um, which again, I think is, is the way to look at these things, that uh, a certain kind of development then allows another module to be added onto that and so our cognition, our technological abilities, our culture, all become much more complex over time. Um, interbreeding with archaic humans in Africa. Um, this, is, this was an absolutely stunning set of papers that came out very close to one another. One arguing the genetic perspective on this 
and one arguing the fossil perspective. And you, you always had to wonder in this business of inter, the, the Eurasians had interbred with Neanderthals and Denisovans, well, what about the Africans? Does that mean that um, they somehow escaped any of this mixture with the more archaic members of the, of the species? And uh, the, the thing is that this fits amazingly well, this whole image of interbreeding not only within Africa, which um, Mike Hammer talked about, but also outside of Africa, which Ed Green talked about, fits astonishingly well with the archaeological data. The archaeological record of Central and West Africa is quite different from the record I described for East Africa. We didn't have time to talk about every region. But the, the center and west um, have a different set. It may not be, we can't absolutely say it's more archaic, but it's a different set of industries. It's not the same thing that's going on in the east. And we, we had uh, suggested that much of this had to do with environment, but perhaps it also has to do with them simply being completely different uh, subspecies of humans. Um, in, at the other end of the world, in East Asia, we've known for um, about 80 years that the, East, the whole sequence of industries in China is quite different from the sequence of industries that's as close to China as Siberia, which really suggested that, um, a, that the invasions into China by humans coming from outside China, China were limited. So that we did have a period when Acheulean type artifacts come into South China, um, as um, some of Rick's work with Chinese colleagues has shown. But we also find that the, uh, the Chinese uh, experiment is very short lived. And we don't have those kinds of bifaces in most Chinese sites after that one period of uh, Acheulean type fluorescence in South China. Um, in, in terms of the fossils, the, um, Chris mentioned um, Isabel Krevkers and my work with other people on the um, human material from Ishango, uh, where the uh, inner ears of these uh, humans, when you CT scan them, um, do not look like the inner ears of, of contemporary Africans, of which there's a large collection in European uh, skeletal collections in lower European museums, um, they look like the inner ears of school and Kafsa, which is an, an, a really interesting issue. So we're looking at something that sort of harks back to an archaic form of, of human rather than to what we would consider a quote modern human. And yet these are 20,000 years old, 20 to 25,000. Interesting evidence of the languages. Um, I'd, I would like to ask Chris a little later. I don't get to ask questions in this summary. Um, but where exactly is the boundary between the Southern African Khoisan speakers and the Northern African speakers of everything else? Um, is it the division between the mitochondrial group that primarily lived from Ethiopia across North Africa? Is it, uh, could we find a similar reflection of these two language groups in the fossils. It's an interesting issue, a possibility for something uh, moving on into, into research questions for the future. Um, so I, I think that um, Ofer, um, also looking at the evidence for the spread of, of modern humans outside of, of Africa, um, noted that, again, the picture is much more complicated than we thought that there are multiple moments when we find modern humans outside the continent, and that they head out in various directions. There may be back migrations into Europe from Asia. Asia gets colonized first, and then Australia, and then finally Europe. And uh, again, I'm uh, curious about where the Neanderthals who went north went. But maybe we can talk about that when the questions come up. Um, and finally, stone tools and cognition. Um, what, to, what to make of this? I'm sorry, Ian, that you felt that you had to talk about stone tools. I think um, we would have been happy if you <laughs> wanted to 
um, spend a little time talking about the, the evidence and then talk about other things you, you were more, perhaps more interested in. Um, but I, I do think that um, the question is how complicated does something have to be before we have to assume that when we find it somewhere else, it was learned from the first people who thought it up rather than reinvented. When, we're, when we talk, for instance, about the smartphone or the transistor, we're certainly not dealing with making it up twice. Um, but when we deal with a hand axe, which even I can make one, um, do we, are we thinking about something that somebody else could not imagine making? I'd, so I'd quibble with him a little bit about Lavalois cores, but we can, we can fight about that later. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, just say to all of you who are students that I think there were a lot of places here, we're at a place in thinking about modern human origins where there are a lot of questions that remain. A lot of work needs to be done, a lot of field work, um, a lot of experimental work that might be able to give us answers to these processes and understanding uh, how something changes from one to another. I mean, a, a sim take a simple experiment. Can you, do you need language to make this certain kind of tool? Can you learn to make it if uh, you just watch somebody do it? Is that good enough? Um, can an ape learn to do it? I mean, there are, all, there are a lot of experiments that we could do with cognition, with things we find in the archaeological record, with um, just with the range of uh, technologies that we see um, and understanding what the genes mean, I think, is another area that, uh, and whether we can get better information out of what we do have is another area that would be inspiring, I think, of, of, uh, for students thinking about dissertations and where they can really make a difference.